Hi everybody, uh, welcome back. <laughs> We're doing a video on the beach. And uh, in this video, we have the pleasure of talking to Alan Chen, uh, CEO of freecashflow.io. It's an accounting agency that helps uh, online businesses to with their tax reduction. You know, you want to pay less taxes, you got to talk to this guy, man. You can't be paying all of it to the government. Okay, you want clean books, you need important financial statements, you need clarity in your financials. You need to talk to this guy. Okay, so... I like to learn some things. I've flown all the way here to the States uh, to learn from himself and to talk to and to share. Okay, so uh, Alan, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I guess give a brief introduction of who you are and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much, Jonathan, for inviting me on your show. Um, yeah, it's been uh, really cool. Thanks. I think you just flew in from Singapore today, right? So. Uh, yeah, my name is Alan Chen. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Free Cash Flow Agency. Uh, we specialize in helping e-commerce and online businesses with their tax optimization, clean bookkeeping, and of, of course, eventually hoping to help get, get them a big sale or a, a merger deal. Um, we really focus on this area because we feel like it's really underserved, and a lot of them have a lot of um, tax deductions that the U.S. government are offering to them that they don't really know about. So a lot of them are just filing the taxes and having to pay a boatload of money and not realizing that you know they can actually take a lot of these tax deductions and really keep a lot of the profitabilities that they really deserve for working so hard in their business. Okay, th thanks for the introduction, Alan. Uh, so I mean, even in the States, right, uh, companies and people, personal level, people pay a lot of taxes, but they don't understand like you need to keep uh, profit in order to actually spend that money, right? So I guess, um, Imagine someone's an e-commerce store business owner running on Shopify, uh, three to five, seven million dollars per year, for example, mid to low seven figures, right? They want to do something about their situation, but do not know how to. How do they uh, get started? Yeah. Yeah, I think the I think a good first step, especially if they have grown their business that big into the seven figure range, is they have to have some sort of good record keeping, right? Or bookkeeping. If they don't, they kind of are a little bit screwed, honestly, right? If you don't have good good bookkeeping, it's hard to know about you know how much expenses your company is really really running at. What are your metrics? What are, what are your growth factors? And how you can be looking uh, forward into the future? Like how how much cash are you have in your books to survive, right? Even even those things are a worrisome point. But just turning on the on the on the, on the tax deduction side, if you're at three to five seven million dollars and you're you're paying anything more than forty percent on your taxes, you're probably overpaying. So you really need to examine your situation and think about if I can keep you know 10% more of my revenue, right? If you think about it, 10% more, five million, five hundred thousand dollars. If I can keep more of that, what can I do with that money, right? Can I invest it into other businesses I'm interested in? Can I reinvest it into the business? Just keep it for personal good if you want to, you know, get a Ferrari or something. But that's a lot of money you're giving up if you're not watching your tax situation. And as Jonathan said, <laughs> it's not the most exciting topic. It's kind of boring. But if you think about the money you can save, I think you're you'll get a little bit more motivated about it. Okay, I don't know about you, but saving money sounds really interesting to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think a lot of uh, people, once they build their businesses, right, they, they forget that they still need to keep it somehow, right? So, I guess, like you said, like what are the low-hanging fruit, what are the easy things that people can do or strategies that, you know, most people do that can help increase that 10 to 20% in that, uh, you know, their after tax. Yep. Yeah, so uh, Jonathan, the, some, some of the things that they really should watch out for are things that might be a little, be a little obvious, but not to everyone, right? So towards the year end time, I'll say Q4, that's when you really want to do some of your tax optimization and planning. Are you, are you spending enough to get in the tax deduction situation you want? Could you be doing things like buying more inventory or prepaying for software or things like that where you can move expenses and accelerate them forward so that you can take more of that deduction now? Are there certain equipment or uh, inventory items you can buy right now that you can, you can have more future benefits? And also, one other thing you can do, um, especially online businesses, is you can also do what they call deferring revenue, right? Which is not accepting cash up front, which is moving it to a later period. For example, if you have clients that are looking to pay you, you can ask them, hey, can, is it okay if you pay me you know, January 5th or January 10th? That, that way, you don't have to recognize the revenue during this year but instead, you can push up to a next year where maybe you have more deductions that you can account for. Okay, understood. Um, I mean, you worked in uh, big four, many big companies. You took company public as well. Uh, can you tell us the secrets of what the big companies do uh, in terms of tax? So, um, if you're looking at in the news and you get see those companies like Facebook, Google, and they're always saying like, oh man, they're paying zero taxes and you get all those complaints. You know the reason why? 
The reason why is they have a team of 20, 30, 40 accountants and finance professionals looking through every pages of that IRS playbook and saying, where can I get find a loophole? Where can I find the legal gray areas where I can get the most deductions? And the thing is, um, you know, you as a small business, it's hard for you to go and hire a whole team of 30, 40 people, right? But what you want to instead do is turn to someone who understands your business intimately and can understand that niche part of the IRS playbook that matters to you, right? So I wouldn't say there's any like secret, but it's more about understanding exactly what in your situation helps you, right? So for example, um, you know, uh, let's, call, let's call this person client A. Client, what client didn't realize when they come to us was they're actually running a home office business, right? Everything they're doing is at home. They're using about 30% of their, of their house to run their business exclusively, which means that they can actually deduct 30% of your mortgage for rent, 30% of their utilities like your electric bill, water bill, gas bill, and 30% of any kind of insurance uh, or repair and maintenance they're doing in, in their house as a tax deduction for their business. Now that could be a huge part. If you're paying, say, you know, two thousand dollars in rent, you're paying another six, seven hundred dollars in utilities. Those things add up, and if you think about it, that times twelve, because there's twelve months in a year, and that that times thirty percent of usage, that's a that's a fairly fair deduction that you can take in your business. And that's part of the tax planning is you may be able to say, hey, maybe I can use my garage next year to store my inventory. There you go. That's another part of your house that you can use as a tax deduction. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, I for us business. And then there's so sorry, there are dropship companies, uh, e-commerce people, and then they are like brands as well. So brands hold inventory and stuff like that, right? Uh, is there like a optimal way to uh, for tax wise in terms of how do we manage cash flow and inventory? Because most of the time people like need to buy a lot of inventory, then they are lacking cash, right? Then they they buy too little inventory, they have too much cash, then they they pay tax, and then that money could have been spent on inventory in the future as well. So how do you try a balance of that? How do you suggest people? in the seven seven figure range deal with that. Yep. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question, Jonathan. So um, kind of kind of like a, a pretty a straightforward answer to that is um, in order to do that you need clean bookkeeping, honestly, right? Well well that first step, it's hard to do what they call forecasting and modeling using the numbers you have. Well, the reason you want to do forecasting is you want to look ahead into that three, six, twelve month period to say how much inventory do I really need? and how, much, how fast am I actually selling my business. A concept called inventory turnover is used here, where is how, many to, how, how fast you can turn over your inventory, and there's, therefore you can kind of calculate the lead time you need to make your next big patch, you know, if you're ordering from Alibaba or some other source, how much time you need for that inventory to come over. Um, and then while knowing, having good bookkeeping, while having good cash forecasting, you won't know how much cash you need to keep in your business to afford your next batch of inventory, right? So a lot of businesses run into trouble where, you know, they become cash poor, like, like Jonathan says, because they just have way too much inventory, they can't sell out fast enough, and then they get stuck in a situation where they can't really, you know, go to the next expansion, they don't know how to do that because they may need to go and need to take a loan from the bank in order to afford the next inventory level, right? So uh, again, the emphasis is boring concept, bookkeeping is king here. You do your books correctly, you can forecast and model, and be able to plan out your next uh, three to six to 12 months, so then you won't be in a situation where you're cash poor, inventory heavy, and you know, not sure where, where to take the business next. Okay, noted on that. Um, another specific question that I have, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of uh, people in e comm space have this as well, is sales tax, right? So sales tax, very, very complicated. I feel like if you sell in the US, um, obviously best market for e comm wise, like, uh, that's the Shop, Shopify notification thing that says on your dashboard, hey, you make 100K this day, or whatever it is, right? But then you owe this amount of sales tax, please uh, settle it now. Obviously, for most people, they don't have access to, um, like you said, 20 different accountants, 20 different specialists to advise them. Um, how, how should people go about this to resolve their tax issues so that, you know, it's once and for all, they, they don't have to worry about it. The IRS is not chasing them and they're just focusing on the important entrepreneur stuff. Yep. Yeah, that, that's correct, Jonathan. So sales tax is a really complex and a huge headache from you know, clients that we have talked to um, in, in our agency. And the reason for that is all the states have different sales tax rules. They have different sales tax rates, they have city rates, they have district rates, they have other jurisdiction rates, and it just adds to the complication. And you literally, I'm not even joking, you have to go to each state's uh, website to figure out what are those specific rules for that state, right? So we have clients that come to us in the seven figure range. They have already triggered in 15 to 20 states just to start off, right? And that means they have to go to Michigan, Ohio, Florida, California, all these state departments, and sometimes 
they're kind of archaic and not very you know technology forward so you have to either call them or go on the waiting waiting line and figure all that out and it's a huge headache for 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 business owners to have to slow down their business figure out that situation because it comes with a lot of uh, consequences if you don't do it correctly you it, there's penalties involved there's interest that they can charge you for not doing your sales test remittance on time and even and worst case scenarios we have seen a states literally ban your LLC if you don't do it long enough right um, and, and the thing is, um, you know, a lot of time, all these businesses need to do is as soon as they see that dashboard to, to pop up, find someone who specializes in your, in your area, in your niche, in e-commerce, and have them help you optimize your sales situation, help them do the registration for you, filing for you, so you're, you're in compliance, first of all, and just leave all that headache and nightmare behind, right? Like, why care about that when you're, you should be the founder and CEO of your company and moving your company forward, thinking about sales strategies and not worrying about, you know, getting IRS with governmental letters and, you know, worrying, and worrying sick at night that, you know, you can't keep uh, operating the business that you put all your sweat and blood into. Um, and because some sales tax thing is coming along to, to, to kind of wreck, wreck uh, you know, your plans, right? So I, I really will heavily recommend that if you do start seeing those dashboard um, things pop up, start contacting the right uh, CPA or accountant that understand your situation and can just really um, knock those problems out for you. Understood. Um, moving on to a separate question. Um, so for example, people who drop ship, um, like they, they go through trends or seasons where different stores, you know, different niches do extremely well. So they don't only have one Shopify business, right? They have multiple uh, businesses as well. How do you recommend those people, for example, they have three to four um, stores in different niches. Should they separate out the financial statement? Should they combine it such as easier? So like, like how do they manage the finances with that? Because technically they're running four businesses or three businesses, but then again, they don't want complexity. Yep. Yeah, we definitely ha have seen clients in those situations where um, you know, they go in one store and it becomes very successful. They're like, so yeah, let me go repeat that in a different industry, right? Yeah, yeah very common situation. So my recommendation is definitely on the, uh, I'm more on the liability protection side. So the whole reason people set up LLCs is to, you know, not get sued and lose everything, you know? <laughs> not get sued and lose their house, their mortgage, their car, everything in between. Um, and LLC helps you protect that. But the problem is, say they sue one of your company and it's a battery operated toy company right it leaked right and it hurt some some kids right you know well, hopefully it doesn't happen to you but it might um and then they sue you and for your business and you lose the lawsuit what will happen is they will come after all your business assets all your cash in that business now if you have decided to combine all four of your business together well they're going to take all all four of your businesses possibly right but if you separate it out to four different LLCs then each one is separately protected by the liability laws so i think that is more of an advantage and something that you should take advantage of if you are able to instead of multiple LLCs especially if your businesses are in different industries so that well, you know, one lawsuit doesn't bankrupt your entire operation that so the, the diversity and being di diversified there is very important okay so would you say it's like for example one holding company and then four LLCs under that holding company. Okay, yeah, pretty much. Okay, got it. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. Um, we will talk about inventory, talk about cash flow and stuff like that, right? Um, do you have any advice on people on, they are scaling, uh, company is doing okay, products doing well, selling well. The issue is that cash, cash is always tight, stuff like that. They need to buy inventory and then they're thinking about taking a loan. Uh, I guess, how should they think about that? How does that affect the accounting side and stuff? And um, you know, because parents always tell you like, taking a loan is bad, right? Like being in debt is bad. <laughs> it feels very scary. So how, how should you advise people in that situation when they are in the growth stage? Yeah. yeah. So Jonathan, you know like the, kind of like the, the richest people in the world, the reason they're able to stay that rich is they don't use their own cash. They leverage the fact that they're rich to let the banks um, allow them to borrow their money to use to grow their business. So for, to, to, to advise these small business owners is, you guys, if you are in the same similar situation, you should do the same. Don't use your own money to fund your business. Instead, if the bank allows you to use their money, definitely use, take advantage of that, right? Especially if you, you know that your ROI is gonna be higher than interest that the bank's gonna charge, right? If the bank's gonna charge four to 5% um, and you think that you can use your money to grow your business in the you know, 10 to 20% range, you should take advantage of that and do that. But, but again, that goes back to the boring concept of bookkeeping, right? The bank's gonna wanna know how well is your business doing? How's your financial health of your business? And if they trust that your business is gonna be able to do that and be able to pay them back eventually, yeah. that's when they have the confidence to borrow that money to you. So you need to have that in place to be in, even in a situation where you can go to a you know a Bank of America or a Chase to ask them to borrow money for you. 
Okay, understood. Um, so generally, uh, e-commerce uh, profit margins probably around ten to fifteen percent. Uh, people in the information products, courses, coaching spaces, profit margin fifty sixty percent. Incredibly cash flow rich, super easy to spend money, high taxes stuff like that, right? So in that situation, imagine someone operating uh, four five million dollars per year, takes home eight hundred k to one mil, right? That's a lot of taxes to be paid, especially in in California. Right, <laughs> so how how should you advertise? Uh, sorry, advise someone like that. What should they be doing? Yeah, like uh, more on the, the e-commerce business or the uh, the service business, I guess the agency business. Uh, I guess a bit of both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, like Jonathan said, California is very expensive to live in. So if you're running an e-commerce or agency business, my first advice is is to move. Actually, <laughs> if you can go to Nevada, you know, there's no state income tax. But you know, like like me, if you cannot, if you have a family, then you have to stay here. Um, but so if you're in the e-commerce business, yeah, your margin is gonna be significantly worse. But then you just have kind of the built-in. Um, expenses and operating expenses in because you have inventory, you have cost of goods sold. So uh, naturally, you're going to be paying less in taxes, but with that, your profit margin might shrink um, with, with, with those cases. As a service business, your margins are definitely higher. Um, so I would say that you know if you're running a service business and you're doing the same level as an e-commerce business, you're most likely going to be better off. Um, you just have to be in a, even more of a, of a mindset of, hey, I have so much of a higher tax bill to pay than the, my e-commerce buddy here. How do I maximize my situation? What are the, the you know the secrets of the world, right? Uh, and, and to name one that I, for for the for the viewers out there is, um, you usually really look into what what they call the, the uh, solo 401k plan. The solo 401k is built for business owners. It's to reward business owners who are uh, single member LLCs because if you think about if you know if you ever been a you know W two or nine to five uh, employee of a company, you also get a 401k but you only get the employee portion of it. The employee portion, I think this year is well up to like $20,500 in uh, retirement deduction you can take. But as an, um, empo- as an owner of your own company, you can get up to $61,000 in tax deduction because you get the employee portion and the employer portion of that deduction. So if you imagine, if you're in, if you're in a business owner right now and you're in your service business, right? And you're looking at your tax bill right now, Think about how much of it can be reduced if you can put $61,000 of that as a tax deduction this year, and that money's not going away. It's going just towards your retirement fund, right? So after you are running this business for five to 10 years, decided, hey, I'm just gonna move to Thailand with Bahamas and you know hang my hat. Well, that money's gonna be there for your, for your retirement and you, for you to use. So then you have, you have nothing to worry about you know, once you sail away to the sunsets. Understood, understood. Uh, I read an article, for example, like Amazon, if they go in R&D, their tax credits is significantly increased, right? It's, it's not just like a, you you pay eighty thousand, you get eighty thousand uh, less in taxes. It's like you pay eighty thousand, you get three hundred twenty thousand in tax rebates, something like that. Like, how does that work? And how can we do something like that for our own e-com businesses? Yeah. So I would say on on the e-commerce side, it might be a little bit hard unless you um, go and invent something. Build so yeah, design. build build something, design it something on your on your own, right? But if you're like drop shipping or just um, white labeling something that that's not your own, that's a little hard. But if you like go and actually design the product from scratch, like actually invent the product, that's when the R and D credit would kick in for you. This is actually most used by SaaS companies. Well, what we've seen, SaaS startups, they employ a lot of engineers, right? A lot of coding goes into it. So um, actual, you know, um, ones and ones and zeros. So those guys, they actually built a, a you know, a, some kind of SaaS product, some kind of online technology product. Um, those guys are able to greatly take advantage of R and D tax credit, which which basically stands for research and development, right? They're able to take their inventions, calculate all the payroll costs and all the labor costs that goes into building this product and basically take a total deduction of all the cost that goes go, goes into it. Um, and it, it's inc- kind of incredible, but it is kind of complex because you do need someone who specializes in R&D tax credit that goes in and be able to prove out that this is how much of the, my labor is actually dedicated to what's capitalizable is what they call, right? Because there's certain expenses that you that you uh, goes into the project that are just what they call maintenance uh, expenses. So then you can't capitalize those. But for the ones you can, that's the one. Those those are the ones you can count as R and D tax credit. And right now with the new laws that are coming out, um, even if you can't. Um, take all the R&D tax credit for the current years because maybe you didn't just make that much income, right? Like you have maybe like three to four million dollar development costs, but you only made a million dollars. Well, um, normally you would lose out on the other, you know, three million dollar development costs. But now you can actually defer that till later years 
to when you do have the income, you can take that full deduction of your R&D tax credit. And credits are very powerful in case um, viewers out there don't know the difference between credits and deductions. Deductions are more of a, a marginal benefit to your situation. So if you imagine if you have a 30%, uh, if you're in the 30% tax bracket, a deduction only getting you about 30% benefit to your taxes. A credit is a dollar for dollar deduction. So if you get uh, $10,000 in tax credit, that's a directly $10,000 refund you're getting back on your tax bill. So it's very powerful and something I would definitely advise those of you who are you know, inventors of e-commerce products out there or if you're running a SaaS company to you know, talk with a tax professional and take, take advantage of that. Okay. Is there like a multiplier on that? You, you spend 80 k you get you know, like 160 k in credits? No. No, I don't think, so. I don't think there's, a, uh, there's a multiplier, but I heard of situations where you, know, you have so much development cost that's more than the, the revenue you're bringing in, and, and you, don't ha you don't have to take it all in one year anymore. You can break that out, so in all these future years, you can still get this benefit, which is, which is amazing. Okay, got it. Um, when, when is there a need to get a fractional CFO? And like, what is a fractional CFO? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the popularity of an outsourced or a fractional CPO these days is, you know, when you take on actual employees in your company, you have to pay them, you know, W-2 wages, you have to deal with the payroll taxes, um, you have to go do benefits, insurance, all that. But with fractional CFO, they're basically a contractor to your company. All you have to do is pay them a salary, which is usually a fraction of the cost of a, a real CFO for your company. But then you get all the benefits of a CFO, which basically runs your entire finance operation and accounting um, side of things, right? So if you think about it, if you just hire a tax preparer or accountant, they may be able to just do your books, um, do prepare your taxes, but they can't really consult and advise you on the higher level strategies. Like, what do these numbers mean? Like, you're just showing me a bunch of numbers on, on paper. Like, what does this mean for my business, you know? And a lot of times business owners like, okay, what do I do with this now? A fractional CFO basically takes all that numbers, give you recommendations, where should I, what should I do next? Like, do my margins look good? Do I look like I can keep growing my business? How much extra cash do I have? Like, do I, can I use my cash to invest in, my sec, in a second business now? Is, is it safe to do so? What's my run rate in my business? Like, am I paying too much in paid advertising right now? Am I, am I, am I, is my return on ad spend good right now? They answer all these questions for you and revise you on what you should be doing. And on top of that, they, they also help you do, do tax planning uh, optimization, right? They, they go in situations like, do I qualify for R&D tax credit right now? How much am I... Um, you know, what should I be doing in retirement planning? Um, they answer all these questions for you, and then when you go into the, um, the due diligence where you're getting ready to sell your business, that's when they really shine and you get the most value out of them. They are the one that can accurately tell you how much of a multiple, how much of a valuation your business is really worth. And if you're expecting something higher, you're expecting, oh man, I was going to get 5x EBITDA right now, and actually they're actually telling you, like, yeah, if you show this to an investor, you're only getting 2x, they'll tell you, what do you need to cut? What do you need to do? to get to that 5x range, right? So then you're not going there blind, you know, if someone like an Amazon aggregator come and give you an offer and they lowball you and you're like, oh man, it's a $2 million offer, but actually your business is worth 6 million, I think you're gonna be screaming in your pillow saying, oh my God, I just lost $4 million, not, you know? But an outsourced CFO will guarantee, uh, especially a good one will guarantee that you're more likely to keep more of the money back in your pocket and be able to have that big payday that you're looking for. Okay, got it. Um, most people, when they hire an accountant, bookkeeper, whatever you want to call it, for the first time, I think the questions that they have is like, um, are you going to fill up my forms for me? <laughs> and then, like, uh, am I, like, are you going to give me the, the clean numbers, right? The clean books and stuff like that, right? So I, those are like two basic questions, right? But then beyond that, people who are not in accounting, for example, like they don't really understand what the value add of uh, an accountant or a firm or whatever it is can do for them, right? So. Can you explain like beyond the obvious, the obvious, they're going to fill out my form <laughs> and they're going to uh, get me clean financial statements. Like besides those two, you know, what, what else can, uh, yeah, how can they value add? Yeah. yeah, definitely. So I know right now there's like a ton of options out there to find like you know, a bookkeeper or an accountant or things like that. You could go on Upwork, even hire internationally. I would actually definitely advise against the international piece because one, um, you know, data, data security and data privacy is very important right now. You want to make sure that you know no one's stealing your information. And you know, going the international route, you obviously open yourself to a lot of risks. Um, I would definitely find someone U.S. if possible. Um, and and the whole thing is, yeah, you can definitely find a tax preparer who you know fill uh, IRS tax forms for you, and then uh, maybe can do some quick book for you, and, and then do do the financial statement, and get you some reporting. Um, like like I like we emphasized kind of on the last question. Um, 
those guys are not going to be your consultants, right? They're not going to be your, your CFO, your advisor behind the scene. Those are the ones that are going to be able to tell you what does those numbers mean? How do I best utilize those numbers to grow my company? Um, what are the most optimized, um, you know, structure, uh, even corporate structure you should be, right? Is LOC the best, best thing I can be right now? If I take on a partner, what does that mean? Do I, do I become a partnership? Is S-Corp optimal because you know, I can save on um, self-employment taxes? What, what's the stage I should be to be a C-Corp, right? Is it when I take in um, like come, come shareholders or some to go into a venture capitalist about, right? Um, those are things where you want an accurate answer. You know, A lot of time you say, oh, I can just Google it, but Google gives you five different types of answers and you don't know which one's right, right? If you hire the right advisor and, and, and strategic a partner for you, you don't have to guess anymore on all those questions. You have someone that can accurately tell you, hey, this is exactly how I need to, what I need to do to 3X my business next year. This is exactly what I need to do to not get in trouble with the government you know, this year. This is exactly the situation I need to be in so then I can be, get acquired by this company out there, right? And a lot of time, businesses don't, don't know that. They're like, oh, I just need someone to, you know, to fill out some forms for me because I don't want to do it, right? And they're like, here, let me get this, uh, you know, cheap guy on Upworks and he'll fill out my forms and that, that's it, right? It's just forms. But, yeah, just forms. It's just forms, <laughs> right? But what they, what they don't know is, yeah, that, that, that's just like, that's just the minimal level of what you actually should be looking for if you're serious about growing your business. Especially if we're really talking about people in the seven figure range, Jonathan, those are the guys who are like, man, I have a legitimate business here. I have a, I have a way to get my business to you know, five, 10, $100 million in one day. But a lot of people go into the pitfall of not really looking at the cash situations, not really understanding what the numbers means for the next coming years. And then they get in such a way of, oh shoot, I ran out of money in my bank, what happened? I ordered too much inventory. Oh, I wasn't optimized. I didn't do cash forecasting. You know, those those things are very common things that can can really uh, make a business fail a lot sooner than they're expecting. Okay, Ken, um, thank you, Alan, for your time. I think we've been about half an hour or so. Um, you feel free to let the audience know how how do they find you. Um, I think you're launching an app as well, right? Uh, something about sales tax. <laughs> so if you wanna feel free to plug that. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate that, Jonathan. Yeah, so um, you know, if you're, if, you, if you're a business out there who are you know uh, thinking about some of the questions that and answers that we, we went through today, and are looking for someone to optimize your tax situation and have the clean booking and really have that strategic advisor for you, yeah, feel feel free. We offer basically a thirty minute um, strategy session when you when you book with us, where we really go through your your your, your situation and really see if we're the right fit. We really don't want to take on any clients that we really don't feel like would be a good fit, and we really can bring value to. If that's what something you're looking for, um, you can. I'm sure Jonathan will include a link um, in, in the description, but it's freecashflow.io slash book if you're looking to book a call with us. And yeah, we're looking we're looking to launch a, a sales tax uh, app this year to help all the shop, uh, Shopify owners out there who's having sales tax issues, who's seen the big red dashboard pop up and getting, you know, the sales tax issues. Uh, feel free to download the free cash flow sales tax app that's in your Shopify store. Um, look for it. And uh, yeah, I think it will really help and things that you're facing. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you on the call. Ken, uh, thanks, Alan, for sitting with me in the call. Uh, guys, I'll put all the links in the description. Anything, um, e-commerce, online business, you run a cost agency, you run a SaaS company and stuff, uh, look for Alan. Uh, I'll put the links below and um, see you soon. Yeah. Appreciate it.